my research group is the theoretical fluid dynamics the turbulence group, which can be an intimidating name for engineers, but not at all, I assure you, for mathematicians. So I'm very interested in uh, turbulence, of course, and in this talk, I'm going to explore the question which was inspired by Charles Dodgson, otherwise known as Lewis Carroll, and in his famous book, um, Through the Looking Glass and Alice's Adventures Underground and Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, he poses through the Tea Party question, why is a raven like a writing desk? And of course, this is a nonsense question because it's a nonsense poetic novel for children and mathematicians, if you've read Martin Gardner's version, The Annotated Alice, which I encourage the mathematicians to read. So I can pose a similarly nonsense question in my own work because I have funded research from uh, the United States Navy to do supersonics for aircraft, and I have funding from NOAA to study tornadoes. And I often ask myself, what is the connection? And we'll explore these four connections, um, which have many different answers. So it's not a unique solution, right, uh, in this lecture. So let's get started. Uh, in the next 30, 40 minutes, I assure you, you might be entertained. Let's see how it goes. So first, it's always good to acknowledge your sponsors, grad students. So I would like to know. The first is the Office of Naval Research, um, who supported me over the last four years, and hopefully they continue to. Uh, the second is NOAA, which studies the ocean and atmospheres. It's our own government agency for that, and they've been very generous in my program. It allows to do research on tornadoes, both experimental, mathematical, and um, measurements in the field, and we'll show those. And a NASA grant to study supersonic aircraft and atmospheric turbulence. So here's the outline of my talk. I want to do a brief bi biography about who I am and my research, where I came from, so you understand a little bit of the context of how I got into this strange um, question. And I'll give an introduction of um, jet flows and tornadoes. And a jet is not really an aircraft at all, that's slang. A, a jet flow specifically refers to a type of fluid dynamic flow, which we'll show and define. And of course, a tornado is something which most people are familiar with uh, through its destructive force of nature. Um, so we'll introduce those. And uh, then we'll talk a little bit about Lewis Carroll's um, tangled tail, if you will, through a curious question. And we'll talk about the Navier-Stokes equations. As you imagine, that's really how jets and tornadoes are connected. So that's starting to give you the hint of my opinion. And uh, that is specifically found through um, what we call an analogy. Because of course, if jets are like tornadoes and ravens are like riding dust, certainly it should be some kind of um, analogy between them. And then I'll show you predictions of these types of flows of tornadoes and jets for, through the analogy we chose, which is literally an analogy in our field. So let's get started. So um, just my personal background, which I like to show, especially when talking to students, currently an MAE, Mechanical and Aerospace, we're the largest department on campus. And for those of you teaching Calculus 3, I know there's a grad student who is currently doing that. You probably have a lot of aerospace and mechanical engineers who are coming up to my classes. So I'll know if they don't know Green's theorem. So I'll be checking. We also look at the United States, I was also a United States Air Force faculty fellow in 2019, and I spent seven years of my life um, serving our country in NASA as a civil servant. I was in theoretical aeroacoustics, which is a branch of combination of aerodynamics and acoustics, which is probably another clue of the connections. Um, it's a research aerospace engineer. And before I was educated at Penn State through a NASA grant, NREL, which is National Renewable Energy Lab, also at Penn State, and I, I did a BS in mechanical, um, but I hung out in the math library too much, knowing the mathematicians and um, in mechanical engineering. And I did some studies in Tegener, Russia, which is now Rostov, and I also came up through Eastern Michigan. So I kind of have a varied life, and I grew up in Michigan, and my personal hobby is probably art history. I'm an art history um, connoisseur, but I promise you we won't get too far into that today. So let's start looking at um, my research group. I'm primarily interested in turbulence, and that's type of chaotic motion. Some people look at it as a dynamical system. It's certainly deterministic, and a lot of people consider turbulence and understanding turbulence both physically and mathematically. Um, you need to do both. You can't do one or the other, and trying to maybe understand the dynamics of what might be considered one of the last great classical questions in physics. And a lot of questions today, of course, are in quantum mechanics and astrophysics. That's what most physics departments are hiring. 
So almost all the research, the predominant amount of research dollars and time and people spent actually in engineering departments now. Because the physicist thinks it's a solved problem is they have these equations, okay. In particular in that area, I'm interested in how sound is produced by turbulence, which has huge impacts in aerospace. For example, many rocket engines um, will explode due to thermoacoustic instability. Satellites fail because of acoustic loading on rockets. And of course, in the aerospace, the aeronautics industry, uh, sound and noise affects people. And with particular um, other effects like nat natural phenomena of acoustics also happens, which you'll see through tornadoes. So this is a central question in fluids. I mean, in people who get into fluid dynamics, which is a huge area, it's very mathematical. There's experimentalists and of course there's numericalists. Very few theoreticians today get into this field. And um, my specialty is, is sort of aeroacoustics. And of course there's multiple ways to solve these problems. There's the analytical people. There's almost nobody doing analytical, theoretical fluid dynamics of any practical value. And uh, that's because of the assumptions you need to make any kind of progress because it's such a difficult problem. Uh, so that's quite a criticism, but that's why you see most people working in the field are working in computational and experimental methods. I try and combine the computate these like three fields. So most of my grants and research and students either work do like pure theory, like mathematical modeling of fluids and acoustics, or they're doing a combination of like computational fluid dynamics mixed with modeling. So it's kind of a niche area. And I mean, people have been studying turbulence and acoustics for many years. And as an example of an early study is in Leonardo da Vinci's notebook, circa 1485. And you can see here, there's a little water drain coming out of a fountain he was sitting by and sketching. You can see it comes out and laminar it goes into like the basin and it comes around and makes beautiful curls and whirls and eddies, which is a highly chaotic motion of a fluid, which is a state of the fluid almost. It's a state of turbulence and we're interested in turbulent flow here. I always like to show a little bit of my past. So this was my um, student team and a few of my associates when I did some hypersonics work at NASA Langley Research Center in my previous life. This is around 2015. And this is the exhaust duct from their eight foot test section. So the, eight, the test section is eight foot in diameter. And we would put air breathing hypersonic vehicles in and aeroacoustics has a tremendous effect on hypersonic flows, meaning flows higher than five times the speed of sound. So the Mach number is the ratio of the velocity divided by the local speed of sound. So this is to study vehicles and devices which go through the atmosphere in Mach 5 or higher, which we're not talking about today. But I think it just shows how serious and large scale the work is. Hundreds of billions of dollars have been dumped into hypersonics, which are just coming into fruitation today uh, to see the outcome of that work. So let's get to the subject at hand. And we'll first look at the contemporary devices today that kind of motivates one side of the work, which is jets. Now jets are really a type of flow field, but as I mentioned before, it's really a slang for a type of aircraft. So on the left in figure three, I showed one particular illustration of an airframe. An airframe is what we call a vehicle being built because it holds, just like a car has a chassis, an airframe holds the engine and pilot cockpit and all the avionics and wings and everything. That's the X-59. So that's being built by Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. And it's a particular aircraft designed to have a low boom that is a low sonic boom. It has a low overpressure when it hits the ground. So you see it's a long, sleek vehicle. So it's a new kind of X-plane. And the X-plane programs, of course, were developed to test all kinds of different concepts that theoreticians, basically applied mathematicians in the field came up with. And of course, they're very loud, um, which out, goes without saying. If you have a supersonic aircraft, it creates a sonic boom. But what's even louder when it takes off and landing is the exhaust and the engine noise, which actually occurs from the supersonic airflow coming out of the exhaust and the engine. Just like a rocket is one of the loudest man-made noises after a nuclear weapon, it can be 175 to 180 dB near the launch pad, which will cause permanent hearing loss. It's so loud that people are very concerned and are dumping a lot of research funds into trying to understand the noise physics of the turbulence coming out of the exhaust. So it's the turbulence from the exhaust that actually creates all the noise from a rocket. It's not coming from inside the rocket at all. And that's the same for these type of aircraft. On the right in figure four, I saw a joint strike fighter aircraft, which is 
the new aircraft being built by a consortium of countries, the United States is the leader, and it is indeed the loudest, probably one of the loudest fighter aircraft in production today. And it's being deployed around the world in all kinds of communities like Japan, in Europe, the United States, Canada, and many other allies. And it's in civilian airports. And so we keep increasing the noise near the airport. So the US Navy and these consortium of countries are really interested in understanding how noise is generated from these jet flows. So this is indeed a jet aircraft, JSF on this uh, Air American aircraft carrier. But you can see there's an exhaust, which is rather hot. It's compressible, it's supersonic. There's shock waves, expansion waves, et cetera, in that exhaust. And that's what creates the noise. And so it's a purely mathematical problem to try and predict from the turbulent flow to predict the turbulent flow and the radiated noise from these problems. And of course, if you're a sailor on an aircraft carrier, you'll have permanent hearing damage in 10 minutes of work with customized hearing protection and overhead active noise control, 10 minutes. And they work on the aircraft carrier deck for 10 hours at a time easily. So that's a major concern and it really hurts, hurts a lot of people. And of course, the taxpayers pay for their benefits afterwards. So let's try and understand a little bit about the physics and the challenge of this problem of predicting the noise from turbulence. In this case, it's a turbulence, turbulent jet. And this is what we call a Schlieren image. And this was taken from my colleague in the lab. I worked in a little bit in NASA's Land Research Center on my trips there. And what you see is a Schlieren image is a slang, a German slang for streak. And so you're seeing density gradients, nabla rho, magnitude of rho, the density of the fluid at any one point in like a high speed camera snapshot. So this camera is a million frames per second, and this is a laboratory nozzle. So if you look back here, there's an engine here and an engine here, you see that red part, that's where the shock cell structure is, the flow. And that's what you're seeing here in a laboratory scale nozzle of a jet flow. So this black part's the nozzle, and they use a system of mirrors not smoke and mirrors, just mirrors to see the actual density gradients. So what you're seeing here is a high speed supersonic flow. So this gas flow from the exhaust of the engines moving from left to right. And these little lines in it are actually shock waves. And these great, these like strangulations or granular looking material is actually a high speed supersonic compressible turbulence. And so obviously these equations are governed by the Navier-Stokes equations, and there's no analytical solution for these, as I mentioned. And we'll look at those in a few minutes, just so you can see that. But the beautiful part of studying jet flows is not only you have to understand all the math and partial differential equations, but you also have to understand all the physics, which it takes years to do. And in our aerospace curriculum, we have a whole required set of courses where students study this phenomenon. And specifically, there's shock waves, which rep represents like a discontinuity in the fluid which is a shock and supersonics. Um, there's something called expansion waves, which is a, where basically the flow reaccelerates to the flow and that's all contained. Of course, this is highly heated and there's often chemistry, which is combustion chemistry, which we're not even talking about today. So that's the jet problem. And you can see it's highly turbulence. Let's move to tornadoes. Um, I had the luxury of being in a tornado in Dayton, Ohio um, uh, two summers ago and they're pretty frightening and violent. And you can see the outcome of one such tornado in figure six on the left, which was in Joplin, Missouri in 2011, where of course lives were lost and the town was decimated. So we were interested in tornadoes, of course, for the idea of early prediction. That is tornadoes might, of course, since they're turbulent, they produce noise and all noise, all turbulent flows produce noise. So we can, might be able to triangulate their positions if we can predict and triangulate their noise through um, a sensor network, which is already being built across the United States by NOAA. Now, one of our NOAA programs on the right in figure seven, you'll see that there's a particular picture which um, our partners who I funded uh, through NOAA in Florida to Texas Tech took this picture and they deploy um, radars and uh, weather systems and satellites and actually capture the formation of tornadoes and measure their acoustic radiation. And we have a whole program to predict the noise and acoustic radiation from tornadoes. The point is they're very destructive and we're trying to create a system to capture their radiation so we can detect their onset. So I'm already giving away some of the clues and you might ask yourself, of course, specifically mathematically, 
why is the supersonic jet like a tornado? So how can I get away with performing a research funding, which is traditionally NASA for rockets, ONR for jets, and then get into the tornado work and many other types of fields? Well, it's because the, indeed they both produce something very beautiful, which as you imagine might be turbulence. But these types of questions came out in Victorian England in the 1800s. And I'll turn to Alice's Adventures in Wonderland for the next few slides um, to kind of set up the funny part of the question. So I say these jets and tornadoes both produce something completely beautiful in my opinion and aesthetic. And the question was also posed in a nonsense context in Alice's book. Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and earlier Alice's Adventures Underground, which was like a preliminary book by Lewis Carroll. The illustrations are by John Tenniel and I show the Mad Hatter and he's actually posing the question. Um, he's actually elbowing the Dormouse, the poor critter. He was probably asleep anyway. So let's just review the fun text. And um, this is from an expert from my copy of um, Alice in Wonderland, which is annotated by Gardner. And so there's the illustration on the right, the original illustration by Sir John Tenniel, who coincidentally also illustrated um, Poe's um, The Raven, which I'll show in a second. So let's just read this together quick. The Hatter opened his eyes very wide on hearing this, but all he said was, why is a raven like a writing desk? Come, we shall see, have some fun now, thought Alice. I'm glad they've begun asking riddles. I believe I can guess that, she added aloud. Do you mean that you think you can find out the answer to it, said the March Hare. Exactly so, said Alice. Then you should say what you mean, the March Hare went on. I do, Alice hastily replied. At least, at least I mean what I say. That's the same thing you know. Not the same thing a bit, said the Hatter. Why, you might just as well say that I see what I eat is the same thing as I eat what I see. You might just as well say out of the March Hare that I like what I get is the same thing as I get what I like. You might just as well say out of the Dormouse, which seemed to be talking in sleep, that I breathe when I sleep is the same thing as I sleep when I breathe. It is the same thing with you, said the Hatter, and here's the conversation dropped. And the party sat silent for a minute while Alice thought all over she could remember about ravens and writing desks, which wasn't much. And this was written, of course, by Reverend Charles Dawson, otherwise known by his pen name, Lewis Carroll, in 1865, a year before the official publication by Macmillan, I believe. And actually, they had misprinting, which they sent off to the Americas, which is a very valuable copy. So it's interesting nonsense questions you can ask to find strange relations. And so you, this actually started a huge storm of people discussing in their letters in Victorian England, because he was very popular in his time. On the left is figure 10, that's Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. And this is also the same illustrator, Sir John Tenniel, who illustrated the Alice series. And you can see here, um, Poe indeed uh, commissioned Tenniel, and you can see the, the very same artistic style of the engravings on wood, in fact, before their printing that Tenniel did. So this is The Raven, uh, which no doubt inspired, and look at the date, Carol's work. On the right, you see a particular writing desk, um, which was fashionable even in Victorian times, 200 year, years later from King Louis XIV. And I took that picture in DC. So you might say, well, what do these have to do with each other? Just like complicated things like tornadoes and supersonic aircraft. And I'll, I'll just summarize some of the answers put forward, um, which you can read uh, if you wish. Um, some are like, because one is good for writing books and the other is better for biting rooks, which is like a chess piece, or because a writing desk is a rest for pens and a raven is a pest for wrens. Um, these were all like winners of a competition that was put out in 1683, or 1883, excuse me, or no, 1683. Um, other ones that were interesting maybe because they both tend to present unkind bills and that a raven has a bill and a desk produces letters. And some of these were close and actually Carol came along and here's Carol's auto portrait. They didn't call them self portraits or selfies. They called them order auto portraits in the advent of photography. And this is his auto portrait in none other than 1896 or it was published in 1896, excuse me, he died in the 1890s. 
So this was taken much earlier in his life. And he wrote, inquiries have been made so often dressed to me as to whether any answer to the Hatter's riddle can be imagined, that I may as well put on record here what seems to me to be a fairly appropriate answer, because it can produce a few notes though they are very flat, and it is never put with the wrong end in front. This, however, is merely an afterthought. The riddle, as originally invented, had no answer at all, much like the title of my talk. So, then you can see the answer is because they both produce a few notes, which is a kind of acoustics and noise, and that was my clue that indeed maybe the jets and tornadoes, they do have the common connection of doing acoustics. So this answer is also true, as I mentioned, for jets and tornadoes, in that the supersonic jet is very noisy, extremely loud, and is probably the loudest man-made device that's controlled after a nuclear weapon. And of course, tornadoes are actually very loud. And if you've talked and read interviews of people around tornadoes, they often describe them as freight trains. But indeed, the loudest part of a tornado is not something that's audible to the human ear. And it actually has frequencies that are dominant below the threshold of human hearing in frequency. In fact, their dominant noise is around six to 10 hertz. So this is a math lecture. So instead of talking about the physical relation, we'll try and talk more so about the mathematical relation. And we might pose the question, how do we predict noise from a jet flow? And in the 1940s, the jet age was born and jet engines were extremely loud in the 40s and 50s. And it was a huge national push in the UK and the America to try and reduce the noise. And nobody understood or even agreed on what made all the noise. And one great mathematician who I'll mention in a second came along and of course answered this question. And for tornadoes, it's a part of active research uh, to understand even what in the tornado makes noise. And of course it's the turbulence, but what kind of turbulence? Where is it located? How does it change for different tornadoes and different turbulent atmospheres? So of course the clue here is they both create noise and that's gonna be their connection. Just like the writing desk and Raven both make beautiful notes. The writing desk makes a beautiful note, which is written and the Raven of course might sing. So I think this might be a little bit of a turbulent picture, which is how I feel facing these questions. So the key, of course, goes back to the Navier-Stokes equations, which is a horrible name for a set of equations because it has a French author, an English author, and an American slandering their names. And often these equations are presented in um, mathematics like American Math Society, and they look at the incompressible form. But that's already given an assumption which we cannot make. The flows are compressible. And it's basically the Navier-Stokes equations as a set of equations are um, conservation laws, meaning that we conserve mass, momentum, and energy, and there's a gas law. And if there's chemistry, we would have an additional equation for every species in the reaction. For example, in a diesel cycle or internal combustion cycle flow, there's probably 5,000 three to 5,000 additional equations you have to solve to solve for the chemistry. So we're gonna leave chemistry by side, the aside here and not worry about that. We'll focus on the core, like pure math problem. There's no real empiricism here except for the gas law, of course. So the first equation, this is a set of PDEs, is the conservation of mass. And we would wanna solve these equations ideally, um, but of course there's no analytical solution. So here's conservation of mass. It's a partial differential equation written in index or Einstein notation. Um, so if there's two J's, for example, we would sum the J's. And this is uh, density is rho, T is time, U is a velocity component for J equals one to three. The second equation is a really a vector equation. It's a momentum equation. So we always do three dimensions here. We never do two dimension. Two dimensional turbulent flow is useless. It has no bearing in reality. Turbulence, all turbulence is three-dimensional. We never have seen two-dimensional turbulence in, in physical systems. So we don't study it, we don't care um, because it doesn't help us solve problems. It is interesting to study mathematically, of course. So that's interesting. So the second equation, again, is rho is density, u is a velocity. This is often termed like a convection type term and it's rho u i u j. So we set i equals one for the first component of momentum and we sum over j 
And then this is a pressure gradient term. The delta sub ij is called Kronecker's, um, Kronecker's function essentially. And if i equals j, it's one. If i is not equal j, it's zero. And then tau ij is the stress tensor. So if you have viscous forces due to viscosity in a fluid, then that also has to be accounted for. And of course, turbulence without viscosity wouldn't be turbulence at all. So turbulence is an important parameter in turbulent flows. So we must include it. So this is the full form. The third equation is the energy equation. This conserves um, total energy per unit mass, where E naught here is the total energy. Once again, P is pressure, Q is heat transfer, and tau Ij is your shear stress term. So this is basically a partial differential equation, which represents the first law of thermodynamics. And here's all the closure of these terms. We have the, the stress tensor can be written as two mu Sij, where mu is the first coefficient of viscosity. We eliminate the second coefficient. If you didn't know there was two coefficients, there are. And uh, this is a non-dimensional number called the Prandtl number named after Ludwig Prandtl. And it has to do with heat transfer rate. And Fourier came into being in the energy equation. We make a Fourier heat conduction assumption. And we write that Q is like a heat transfer rate that goes as C sub P, which is the coefficient of specific heat, a constant pressure. Mu again is viscosity and capital T is the temperature. So solve these equations in three dimension, which is changing in time. You have the density, you have three velocity components, you have the pressure and temperature and, uh, and energy. So you have a lot of unknowns in a system of equations. And of course, if we say the flow is incompressible, we say viscosity is constant, which it's not, we still don't have an analytical solution. So we have choices. We can do experiments and ignore the equations altogether and let mother nature essentially solve the Navier-Stokes equations for us from a mathematical point of view. We can try them and solve them analytically, which is very difficult. And I'll show you one approach to find acoustics from these equations without doing any computations. Or we can do it for them from CFD or combine our approaches to find acoustic solutions. So that's what direction we're going here. So it's fun to look at a little bit of history. So who is Navier? His full name is Claude Louis Marie Henry Navier. He's my personal hero. He lived from 1785 to 1836. Engineer physicist, he's known mostly today, of course, for Navier-Stokes equations in my field. He's a professor at Ecole Polytechnique. And if you go to France today, you can actually still cross some of his bridges. He was indeed a civil engineer. Um, and if you look at the Eiffel Tower, he's one of the um, 78 names on the Eiffel Tower. Stokes, which I'm sure you've seen as a prolific mathematician, was a Lucasian professor of math at Cambridge, and his name also bears the Navier Stokes equations. Um, he was the president of the Royal Society, and he did not believe in evolution. In fact, he didn't believe it in so much that he was the president of a society to reject evolution. Um, a very um, religious person. He didn't want to get married. An interesting story about him is that he actually wrote a 55 page letter to a woman named Mary Susanna Robinson who wanted to marry him about why they should not be married. And um, you can read this letter online in the history of the Navier Stokes equations or history of George Gabriel Stokes. Uh, he was really smart. And of course, um, he got into fluid motion because he wanted to calculate time and he studied the pendulum problem. And of course the pendulum problem was related to the unit of time. And so he wanted to find the flow around a sphere connected to a pendulum. Today we call this Stokes flow. And of course it's a type of solution with a lot of assumptions of the equations I just showed. So how do we find acoustics from these types of flows? That is we have a system of equations um, and we might have a turbulent field which you might know from a computation experiment, but how do we find the acoustics? is you can't necessarily just go out with a measurement. Because you, you, from the measurement, you just find the acoustic signal. You don't know anything about the turbulent field. So that's rather frustrating. So there should be some technique to understand how sound is generated from turbulence. So what we know is that the jet flow, the tornado, and all other flows, the flow through your lungs, uh, parts of your blood flow, uh, the atmospheric turbulence in the atmosphere, um, the flow in the oceans are all turbulent, and they all produce a type of acoustics from the turbulence. And they're all governed by the same set of beautiful equations, which are the Navier-Stokes equations. We won't worry about electromagnetics. There are flows with electromagnetics like plasmas, which can be turbulence. And I should also mention that this is still one of the 10 unanswered questions in, of course, the um, Clay Mathematics Institute. So they want to show, hey, if you can show existence uh, or um, 
uniqueness of a incompressible Navier-Stokes set of equations, then you know I think you win the prize, a million dollars in clay, clay um, prize. But this would not do anything of practical value for prediction uh, because you make the assumptions which are invalid for a turbulent flow in nature. Uh, so it's a great problem to work on, but don't expect any accolades from anybody except I think in the math community because it won't advance our theory of turbulence. Uh, and that's quite a criticism. Um, but I, I still think that work is really valuable because of course it's mathematical work and I'm sure there will be some value from it, but it won't be solving the problems that we're presenting here. So we wanna try and predict a noise from this general turbulent flow and apply it to the particular solutions of jets and tornadoes as an examples. So nobody did this. And along came another mathematician, Sir James, that is Sir Michael James Lighthill. And he was a uh, British from 1924 to 1998, unfortunately passed away in a swimming accident. And he created what we call the acoustic analogy, which is a mathematical type solution of the Navier-Stokes equations to predict the acoustics from a turbulent field. Um, and he worked on many things like the Concorde. Um, he was also a Lucasian professor, just like Professor Stokes, same seat, which of course is preceded by like, by like Green and Hawking, et cetera. Uh, one thing he's also known for is starting the AI winner, which probably set back AI research in the United Kingdom and maybe the world by 20 to 30 years. So it's very interesting that a very smart mathematician like Sir James was a thought that artificial intelligence research would not lead to anything. And that stopped all AI funding in the UK for decades and led to what they call the AI winner. So you can read about that if you want. So in 1952, when he was in his lower 20s, about 20 he, in 1950, he published a report, which is unpublished, um, but then it made um, actual press. It was released by the government and allowed to be published in 52 and 1954. And these were basically two mathematical articles in the Royal Society of, to predict sound from turbulent fields without the use of a computer. And so he modeled the turbulence with mathematics and scaling laws and he was able to predict the noise intensity from jet flows. So here's how he did it in two, one basic sentence, and I'll read it. He combined the time derivative of the continuity equation with the divergence of the momentum equation, and he put them together in the conservation of mass and momentum equations after those operations, and he could write the equations without any assumptions as this equation, which we call today the acoustic analogy. So this is nothing but the second partial derivative of time of density minus the speed of sound squared, the ambient medium, C, times partial two rho, partial xi, partial xi. So that's just like a Laplacian operator, right? On density rho, the density of the fluid, is equal to partial two ta ij, partial xi, partial xj, which is a double divergence term. And ta ij is what we call the light hill stress tensor. So what he did is he took the conservation of mass and momentum equations from the Navier-Stokes equations and rearranged them into a left-hand side operator of a wave equation and right-hand side of everything else. He just put every, all the other terms in the right-hand side. And he called those the equivalent sources and that's what we call them today. Now you see in this equation, it's not really an inhomogeneous wave equation because ta contains rho. And so you have density on the right and left-hand sides. But the trick is you have a wave operator on the left. And you can try and solve this equation with a Green's function. This is not Green's theorem, like you learn about calculus three, but something new for some of you. So he constructed this equation and he said, okay, I'm gonna solve this with the method of Green's functions. Uh, the problem is you need to know the right-hand side. So you would need to estimate that through experiment, CFD, which is numerics or modeling. And of course he did this before table computers were available. So he had to model the right-hand side. In our work today, we'll do CFD over like a tornado and jet, and then fill in the right-hand side, solve this wave equation and predict the acoustics. So let's look at that. So this brings you back to Green's functions. And George Green was also a British, and he had a shorter life than the other people I discussed from 1793 to 1841. And he actually grew up in a mill. And if you go to England today, you can actually visit Green's mill, which is a tourist attraction. It's rebuilt, it's not the original mill. And he was completely self-taught as a mathematician. And he published a famous essay called Essay on the Application of Mathematical Analysis to the Theories of Electricity and Magnetism. And so he was really the forefather of electromagnetics, which Maxwell based a lot of his work on George Green's work. 
Anyway, he did work in hydrodynamics, sound, and optics, but a lot of his work was unrecognized until he, uh, five years after he passed away, where Lord Kelvin popularized it. And that's really where I think a lot of the theorems that our students learn in undergrad courses really learn it. But they don't learn about Green's functions, which is a technique of solving partial differential equations with linear operators. And you'll see that indeed the left-hand side, even though density isn't an acoustic fluctuation, it is linearized operator because we only do not know rho on the left. So let's just look at a basic Green's function for those of you who don't know it. We can basically solve a lot of types of PDEs this way through the theory of vector Green's functions. We're not doing scalar equation. Um, in my work, we actually do vector, not scalar Green's function. We don't go into that today. But the idea can be illustrated through a simple ODE, and this is adapted by a book by Duffy, which I'll mention in a second. So let's just consider the general equation, capital T times partial to U, partial X squared equals F of X. Here, we'll just say T is a constant and F is some right-hand side. So the right-hand side here in acoustics would be the double divergence of tau, capital T, the light hill stress tensor. And we would just seek a solution. So here we take this equation and replace it U with G and call that the Green's function. And the right-hand side will set as the direct delta function of X minus psi. And um, that's nothing but basically the integral of that is one for X equals psi and zero otherwise. And it's a generalized function. So there's a wonderful six volume set on generalized functions offered by the AMS. And if you're really interested in why this works, you'll have to look at that theory first and then also look at some of this book by Duffy, uh, which shows solutions of Green's functions. So we do this replacement. And of course, I define the direct delta function as being infinity for basically when it's zero and zero otherwise. And then you set the boundary conditions. But the boundary conditions you're setting for the Green's function, not for the original differential equation. They might be different. And indeed, they are different in acoustics and turbulence problems when you're solving this. There's a detail I don't want to get into today. I just want to show you the big picture. So in this case, for a certain set of boundary conditions, you can find analytic solutions for G for this particular problem. And in, in this case, they're linear. It's AX plus B for zeros less than equal to X less than psi and CX plus D, which are constant coefficients for psi less than X less than equal to L, in the domains from zero to L, for instance. And then you can write the solution as U, as we showed from the previous question, equation as a function of integral from zero to L of F of psi of G of X operating on psi d psi. So it's a convolution integral of the Green's function with the right-hand side source. So if you find the Green's function from a direct delta function right-hand side source, you can integrate it over the whole domain and write out the solution as an analytical solution. So the idea is here, we have a wave equation. And the Green's function for the wave equation, which is the left-hand side of the light hill acoustic analogy, uh, is known. So we can use the classic wave equation Green's function. And this is all shown in a book called um, Green's Functions with Applications from 2001 CRC Press by Duffy. It's a great introduction to Green's Functions. So therefore, we can immediately write the solution for the density fluctuation at any point in space and time if we know the right-hand side. And in Lytle's work, he modeled turbulence uh, through experimental observation, creating models of the turbulent field of a jet, which is hard to do. And that's a whole nother lecture. But the idea is if he could set the right-hand side to be equivalent acoustic sources of the jet, he could predict the acoustics. And it's the same thing for a tornado. And we can exactly calculate tau ij, because it's just a function of densities, pressures, velocities, and temperatures of a tornado a jet, which we get from CFD. And then we can quickly calculate the acoustics outside or any position we want. So in this case, what Lighthill did, he saw the Green's function, he placed um, rho with G and set the right-hand side to the direct delta functions in space and time. And the analytical solution in this equation is shown here. It's a direct delta function uh, over four pi with X minus Y. That's just the distance from the acoustic source to the observer. And C is the speed of sound. Ta is the time of the turbulence and T is the time at the observer. There's two different times related by the propagation distance and the speed of sound. So here's the closed form solution that Lighthill wrote in this paper. So if you can imagine, we're taking the double divergence of this volumetric integral where we know Lighthill stress tensor and we know all these other quantities and then we can find the fluctuating density, which is the, we can convert to acoustic pressure. And we can do this for any type of flow. That was really a 
probably why he got the Lucasian chair for mathematics, amongst other things. So that's all well and good, but we still need to have boundary conditions. We need a computational domain. We need observer locations. And those are just set by the particular problem. And to find the right-hand side, we can use CFD, which I'll show in this particular work. I've done modeling like Vital did for other works for certain turbulent fields using turbulence theory. Or we might find statistical methods or combinations. Um, usually when you predict noise or turbulence quantities, you do it statistically. Um, because that's what we can compare with measurement. It's very hard to de compare a deterministic turbulent field with a predictive one because it's so chaotic. Uh, so we'll integrate this acoustic analogy, um, actually more complicated forms using vector equations from Navier-Stokes instead of the wave equation from Whitehill. Um, but at the end of the day, we find something called the spectral density. And spectral density, you might learn from digital signal processing, which is a field dominated in electrical engineering to how you take and take measurements and make sense of them, digital measurements. And so we would take the Fourier transform of the acoustic pressure times its complex conjugate, and that we get the spectral density. And that's what we found sound pressure level in decibel from, which I'll show in a couple of slides. So let's talk about what we're doing in our labs today to get those flow fields to evaluate the acoustics with, to understand the physics of the flow. So probably over the past 80 years, people have been doing very careful jet experiments for acoustic purposes, and also just to understand the physics of turbulence and a flow with the properties I described earlier. So in the lower left, we have a program, and in the building I'm in right now is a anechoic chamber. So the walls have anechoic treatment to absorb sound. And here, this metal thing is actually the plenum for the nozzle, and this metal part where my cursor is moving is the nozzle itself. This is zoomed in with a system of mirrors, which are not shown to create the picture in the lower part. So this lower right picture in 15 is the experiment. And that's a Schlieren image. And it's an instantaneous shot. Well, excuse me, time average shot. So they average a lot of exposures of the film. In this case, it's digital. And you see uh, this is the jet flow field coming out of the exhaust here. The top picture is an accompanying computational fluid dynamic simulation, which we performed at University of Florida. One CFD simulation for one jet flow will take 30 days on 2,000 CPUs, and that's not accounting for the eight cores per CPU. So you're looking at about 16,000 cores, 24 hours a day for 30 days to find this CFD solution using a spectral element theory, solving the equations, which I showed earlier. So it's very expensive. And we would take this CFD field, and now we have an experiment we have a numerical simulation and we have theory through acoustic analogy to try and understand how the turbulence creates noise. Let's do the same thing for the tornadoes. With our partners at Texas Tech through our NOAA program, they did field measurements. In the left, you see an infrasound microphone, which is a $3,000 microphone plus all the other DAQ data acquisition system. And it's measuring, they, they went out at 7.30 in the morning and central daylight time. I think this was in um, Northern Texas. And you can see there's a tornado forming. So we have the technology to get to a location to measure acoustics from the formation of a tornado. And from that information, we would use a system that's distributed across the country to try and detect their formation. On the right, my colleagues at Penn State do tornado CFD. That's their full-time um, research. And they give us that data to analyze the turbulence statistics and noise sources. So here we see a contour plot of the intensity of the noise source forming in a EF5 tornado. These are not one for one. This is a full tornado CFD. And their CFD also takes about a week to do on a four or 500 CPUs. It's not as intensive as jet. And there's reasons for that I can talk about if you want. And so here you're seeing at one particular frequency of eight hertz, that's below the threshold of hearing. We can't hear eight hertz, so it's infrasound of the sound source in the tornado. So this is the ground along the x-axis and the y-axis is the altitude. So you can see at eight hertz, the peak frequency from the tornado is around 100 meters high and it's distributed. And so we evaluate the integrand of Whitehill's acoustic analogy and plot that on a per frequency basis to visualize the noise source. So, Here's the most important picture. On the left, we see the predicted acoustic spectra from my jet flow. And on the right, 
we show predicted acoustic spectra from a tornado. The x-axis on these figures is Struhlhahn number, which is a non-dimensional number of frequency. So the x-axis is frequency on log scales from low values to high values. The y-axis is sound pressure level per unit Struhlhahn number in decibels. So you can imagine that's like an amount of energy. So how you interpret these graphs is you like maybe look at a point and say, okay, well, this point here is about 140 dB decibel at 0.1 ST. And that's a non-dimensional frequency based on the jet velocity and jet diameter. All acoustic work is done this way because we can actually collapse through similarity theory, turbulent flows and their acoustic radiation. On the right, you see the same type of figure zoomed in between six and eight Hertz, which is the dominant frequencies of tornadoes. It basically falls off just like the jet case on the left. And so you can see in both cases, turbulent flows always produce, and there's exceptions when there's shock waves and other phenomena or turbulence interacting on the surface, but generally broad lobes in the spectral domain, as you see here. Generally, that's the statistic we predict for these types of flows, because it's most interested. Because of course, from these, you can calculate other noise metrics and see if people are gonna lose their hearing. Um, we can even synthesize the acoustic signals so we can replay it with computers, and there's actually research groups who do that. But the idea is, it is the same set of equations, it's the same prediction algorithm, there's the same turbulence, the same type of turbulent structures in tornadoes and jets, and they produce very similar acoustic radiation, but it just sounds different because of course it's at different frequencies. In fact, the tornado would be silent a few miles away in its dominant frequencies, unlike the jet. So we might make some fun summarizing conclusions. We might say, why is a raven like a writing desk? Well, Carol, of course, said that they both can produce beautiful notes. We might also say, well, why are jets like tornadoes or like any other turbulent flow? Well, I would say in response to Carol's uh, writing earlier, because they both produce beautiful noise. So ravens and writing dust might produce beautiful notes. I believe turbulent flows always produce beautiful noise. Maybe an improvement over Carol's question mathematically, because of course he was a mathematician and he was employed as a mathematician in a university in the UK, is that they are both based on the same equations, which are the Navier-Stokes equations, which are a wonderful set of equations to do research on. Even if you're doing two-dimensional incompressible with rho equals, vis, you know, rho density equals viscosity, that's fine, all the way up to something with chemically reacting or plasma flows with electromagnetics and chemical reactions. It's always the same equations, and I think that's wonderful. Indeed, the like notes from the Raven are governed by the same equations for the jet flows and tornadoes. And I have been involved with, and my colleagues have been involved with, for research of studying flow through the lungs and how our vocal cords through fluid structure interactions and turbulent motions through our lungs creates the sound of our voices. And that's the exact same set of equations, the Navier-Stokes equations. So the study of turbulence is really dominated in engineering, and there are some very fortunate mathematicians who work for Niagara Stokes, and we're really fortunate here at University of Florida I have hired some experts in PD and Navier Stokes, and I've met them, and I, I'm really excited to work with them in the future, I hope, and they're part of our PhD committees. Um, that being said, how turbulence creates noise is still a fundamental problem, because we don't understand turbulence. And the sources through the analysis are equivalent sources, they're not the actual sources. And my current students, um, who are some of them are graduating now, have put on a firmer theoretical basis through their analysis and validation through experiment what those noise sources are for different components of turbulence and shock waves, et cetera. And of course, this is all very relevant to society from annoyance and, of course, hearing loss. And the importance of stunning turbulent flow. So thank you very much for your time today, and I'll be happy to take any questions.